Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, as uh, Heidi introduced, I'm going to talk about keratoconjunctivitis sicca, also called uh, dry eye, uh, that, as we all know, is a very common condition that we see uh, often in general practice. Um, but uh, what is dry eye uh, exactly? Um, it's the clinical condition associated with the lacrimal gland hyposecretion, which is also called quantitative tear deficiency. This can happen directly with direct damage to the lacrimal gland or indirectly when you have a problem with the nerve supply to the gland. Uh, it's important to remember the quantitative tear deficiency term because we also deal with other tear film disorder that can be also uh, uh, difficult to recognize if you don't have uh, the clear uh, differentiation between the two things. So the qualitative disorder are all the deficiencies of the tear component uh, other than the aqueous part of the tear film. And obviously we also have uh, uh, all those distributional abnormality that lead to uh, a qu quick evaporation of the tear film from the ocular surface and that can result from uh, lagophthalmos, which is the incomplete closure of the eyelid, ophthalmos, exophthalmos, uh, or any uh, trauma to the eyelid that uh, uh, alter the normal blinking reflex, uh, corneal anesthesia, and uh, nictitans uh, uh, deformities. So just briefly uh, go through the components of the tear film so we have a better idea of uh, uh, which part of the tear film is produced uh, by which glands uh, and uh, that also help uh, to uh, localize uh, uh, the problem when you are doing your diagnosis. So mainly we have uh, three layers uh, of the tear films uh, and uh, the first one, the inner one, is the mucin layer which you can see uh, highlighted in red and uh, this layer is mainly important because it keeps the tear film adhered to the ocular surface. And then we have uh, uh, the middle aqueous layer, uh, which is uh, the blue one, and uh, finally the superficial lipid layer, which uh, uh, is very important because uh, it does avoid the aqueous layer to evaporate from the ocular surface. And then each layer, as I mentioned, is uh, mm, secreted by a different gland. The mucin layer is uh, mainly secreted by the conjunctival goblet cells, the aqueous layer by the lacrimal glands. Uh, and you can see in this picture taken from Gelat, uh, we've got two glands that produce uh, the aqueous layer. The main one is the orbital gland that is located uh, in the upper lateral. Uh, finally, the lipid layer is produced by the meibomian glands that are located in the eyelid margin and uh, we've got approximately 30-40 glands per each uh, eyelid and uh, the lipid comes out through little uh, opening uh, at the eyelid margin. Uh, there, are, uh, uh, there is a long list of causes of dry eye. Uh, infectious causes uh, include, uh, for example, uh, canine distemper virus infections, uh, um, any um, ocular surface infections, uh, and uh, um, keratoconjunctivitis, chronic keratoconjunctivitis, for example. Um, congenital causes uh, are uh, quite rare, but it's important to recognize them. And then uh, don't forget also the ichthyosiform dermatosis, which is uh, uh, also called the Carly Cot syndrome in the Cavalier King Spaniel. Um, uh, many drugs can induce dry eye. Uh, the most common that we uh, might come across while we work in general practice are sulfonamides. Uh, but also atropine, for example, both uh, systemic and topical decrease tear production and uh, uh, obviously any pre-anesthetic or anesthetic drugs. And this is very important to remember uh, on your surgical patient because you want to make sure the ocular surface is well lubricated before they undergo the procedure and afterwards uh, to avoid uh, the risk to develop uh, ocular surface ulceration. Um, surgery can, can induce also dry eye. Uh, we are well aware that uh, cataract surgery, for example, can cause dry eye. Uh, also, evisceration and uh, uh, intrascleral prosthesis can cause dry eye. And obviously, the failure of uh, uh, replacing a prolapsed uh, third eyelid gland 
or the excision of the of the of the eyelid uh, of the third eyelid gland in a predisposed breed. And then we have a neurogenic dry eye, <coughs> which is caused by uh, a problem in the parasympathetic innervation to the lacrimal gland. And uh, this is a quite uh, characteristic presentation because uh, it's a very, uh, very, very uh, dramatic uh, and sudden uh, reduction in the tear production. Um, many metabolic diseases can also cause dry eye, uh, amongst the most common diabetes, hypothyroidism, and Cushing disease. Uh, irradiation uh, as well is something we want to keep in mind. You may have an oncologic patient that is referred for radiotherapy of the head and is very likely uh, going to develop a dry eye and trauma to the orbit uh, and, uh, and the globe. Uh, most of the cases that we see uh, are, do not have uh, an obvious underlying cause and we know from uh, histology studies that uh, they are characterized by a lymphoplasmacytic infiltration and an atrophy of the gland, which means that uh, is likely an immune-mediated basis for this process. And this is confirmed by the fact that uh, most of the dry eye respond to immunomodulant treatment. Uh, so just remember that uh, most of the, the, the dry eye that we see are immune-mediated in origin. Any dog can develop dry eye, but uh, we know that there is a genetic predisposition. Uh, I've got a list of uh, the most common uh, uh, breed that can be affected by dry eye. Uh, Cavalier King Charles Spaniel is the king of the dry eye, but then we also have the West Island Cocker Spaniel. We see a lot of English Bulldog and uh, Shih Tzu, for example. <coughs> In terms of clinical presentation, I've divided in uh, the acute and chronic. The acute is the uh, most uh, rare form, the chronic is the most common, but the acute is uh, important to keep in mind because uh, it's quite, uh, uh, it's quite uh, dramatic and uh, the tear uh, film production drops very quickly and uh, you will have uh, a dog that present uh, with uh, very acute pain, often uh, won't be able to open the eye, and uh, we will have uh, associated corneal ulceration that can be extremely deep uh, and uh, can lead to perforation very, very quickly. <clears throat> the chronic, the most common uh, form, is the one that uh, is uh, mostly misdiagnosed because uh, the initial signs uh, are very uh, specific. You can have uh, just a mildly red eye with intermittent uh, discharge, uh, mucoid or mucopurulent if there is a secondary bacterial infection. The ocular surface uh, will not look shiny as it should. And uh, with time, uh, the conjunctival uh, redness, hyperemia will, uh, will increase. And uh, at this stage, uh, it's easy to misdiagnose with with a conjunctivitis. I always uh, uh, advise uh, to assess uh, the, the type of discharge that you are dealing with. Uh, in uh, a, a, a pure, uh, purulent conjunctivitis, uh, your discharge will be yellow, but it will be fluid and will be quite easy to flush away from the eye. In a dry eye, you will, you will have a care that describes a tenacious mucus discharge that uh, will stay attached to the ocular surface and will be difficult to remove. Obviously, as I mentioned earlier, you can have a combination of both if you have a secondary bacterial infection, but uh, the, typical, uh, uh, the typical description that the carrier will give you is that uh, the dog wake up in the morning with the eye all crusty and uh, difficult to clean. Uh, with time, uh, the, the situation obviously, if it's not addressed, uh, will deteriorate uh, and you will start seeing a blood vessel growing uh, on the corneal surface. Uh, and at this stage, the eye will be very red uh, with this uh, strange blood vessel on the corneal surface. You may think about some like episcleritis thing. And, uh, <clears throat> and obviously, with progression, you can also have development of corneal ulceration. Uh, if uh, the uh, eyelids are also affected by uh, this constant discharge attached to the surface, you can also have development of blepharitis and uh, periocular dermatitis. It's very important to assess the comfort of the dog. These dogs will be sore. 
uh, if you speak with people that suffer of dry eye, they will uh, describe this as having sand in the eyes. So it's definitely uh, something that you want to keep in mind. Blepharospasm uh, is the first thing that you need to look for. <clears throat> Diagnosis is the most simple di diagnosis in the ophthalmology field. Uh, you just need the shimmer teeth test that is available in any practice. And uh, we've got guidelines uh, to assess the severity of the problem. Uh, general rule is that uh, the normal teeth production should be between 15 and 25. Anything uh, uh, below this uh, is considered a dry eye and anything above that uh, uh, you need to think that you might have uh, some irritation to the eye that is causing excessive lacrimation or a problem in the tear uh, flow. <clears throat> Medical treatment. Uh, most important ones are lacrimomimetics and lacrimostimulants. Obviously, you may want to add uh, an antibiotic if there is a secondary bacterial infection. Some cases might also need anti-inflammatory, but it's more rare. So lacrimomimetics is the first thing that is very important because we want to keep the eye comfortable until our immune modulant drug start working. So any, we've got a wide range of product in, uh, available and anything that uh, contain carbomer, sodium hyaluronate or hypermellose will be good. Uh, normally uh, to be administered four, six times daily, but depending on the severity of the problem, you may want to increase this. Lacrimostimulants, I have divided them in cholinergics and immune modulants. Uh, amongst the cholinergics, what is mainly used is pilocarpine, and this is used for treatment of uh, neurogenic dry eye. Pilocarpine is a drug that uh, we don't use very often and uh, is uh, not uh, like uh, a classic uh, uh, traditional administration. First of all, it comes as an ophthalmic solution, but it goes in the food. <laughs> because uh, obviously you can administer it in the eye, but uh, we found that uh, it's very stingy and actually works better if it's given in the food. So the normal uh, administration is uh, a starting uh, uh, dose of one drop every 10 kilos and uh, <clears throat> to be administered twice daily. And this dose should be gradually increased. Lacrimostimulants, uh, the most important are cyclosporin and tacrolimus. Those two are uh, T-cell uh, uh, inhibitors uh, and uh, they are classified as uh, calcineurin inhibitors because uh, what they do, they basically cross the lymphocyte uh, membrane and when they're inside the lymphocyte, they basically bind uh, with uh, their own specific immunophilin and uh, this uh, complex uh, bind to calcineurin that uh, inhibit uh, interleukin-2 that uh, uh, activate the T-cell. So the T-cell uh, are inhibited and uh, the uh, teeth production start uh, working again. They need to be administered uh, twice daily or uh, even three times daily in severe cases. And remember, this is very important, they need a loading of several weeks. So I always wait for six weeks until I reassess the response to the drug and need to be administered religiously. Um, I also thought I would briefly mention uh, surgical treatment for dry eye um, and uh, episcleral cyclosporin implants are a very good solution in those cases where you have a poor compliance of the dog for topical treatment or of the carer because maybe they spend all day outside and they can't do the treatment properly. Uh, there is a nice paper by Baracchetti uh, from 2015 that uh, um, compared the dogs non-responsive to the topical treatment and dog responsive and uh, they found that uh, both uh, were uh, uh, improved uh, using episcleral cyclosporine implants. So this is something that we occasionally do at the RALF and uh, we find that very useful in some, in some situation. And then obviously the parotid duct uh, transposition surgery that uh, we would consider only in those cases that were not responsive to any strength of the immune modulant treatment for at least 8-12 weeks and if the dog is still very uncomfortable. It's quite invasive procedure and is not free of complication. Uh, just briefly for uh, uh, who is not uh, uh, aware of this procedure is basically uh, using the saliva to substitute the tears. So what we want to do is reroute 
the parotid duct toward the lateral lower uh, conjunctival fornix and the saliva will be produced every time you feed the dog. Thanks everyone for coming. It's, it's a really good turnout. Um, nice, to, nice to see everyone here. Um, I went with this title because as the team will know, I do like a play on words for the first bit. Um, but I guess ocular pharmacology is such a massive, um, a massive topic. You could spend hours and hours chatting about this. So um, as Heidi said, I'm going to try and just go through a few of our kind of top tips, the kind of drugs that we use, things that we'd recommend uh, going for. So we'll, we'll see how we get on. So just, I was having a think about kind of what are our licensed products um, in the, the veterinary market, really. And I could kind of, this won't be an exhaustive list, but I was kind of off the top of my head thinking, you know, there's, there's isothel, there's opfacycline. We've got tyosol, which is gentamicin, um, then obviously optimina and, and vergan. I was trying to think back, you know, how many of these have, have I used over the last, the last three, four years? And um, I think isothel for a few staff pets. Um, <laughs> opfacycline, I think we used for one, uh, one, one ulcer. Um, Tysol, I haven't actually dispensed, and then obviously Optimine and, and Vergan we do use. So that leaves us with a, a bit of a conundrum, obviously. We're going to be going off license with a lot of our medications with, with Optho. Um, so it's just something we have to make our carers aware of, and something obviously in, in general practice you guys would need to, to be doing too. Um, so I'm going to run through these, these kind of drug classes. I know thanks to, to Azura for, um, for obviously going through the dry eye section already. So we'll leave out the, the lubricants and obviously the, the lacrimose stimulants from, from that side. Um, so from an antibiotic point of view, I think, you know, our, our go-tos as a, as a first line most of the time is going to be uh, chloramphenicol eye drops. Um, we also use ofloxacin, which is obviously exocin as a trade name. Um, and then I just wanted to briefly chat about um, fusidic acid or, or isothel there too. So looking at chloro, um, it is a bacteriostatic antibiotic. Um, it's, uh, it works by inhibiting bacterial protein synthesis. Um, it has a nice broad spectrum of activity, so you've got a really good gram-positive um, effect. You do have some gram-negative too, but we'll get to that in a bit. It does have some limitations there. Um, I'm going to go through kind of the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of each of these, and, and we'll see, see you know, when we would use them, when we wouldn't use them, and then some of the, the other side effects that you can have with them. So. Um, Chloramphenicol is very good for bacterial keratitis, so that'll involve, um, you know, a lot of our, our, our first-line ulcer treatment. Um, so anything from like a, a sked to a stromal ulcer that doesn't look nastily infected, we'll, we'll normally go for chloro as a, a first choice. Frequency of application, it's normally going to be between three and four times a day as a, as a, a standard. Obviously, that does vary from, from ulcer to ulcer. Um, and then we do use them as prophylactics. Um, they'll be following uh, corneal and sometimes some of the agonexal surgeries. So your, your superficial keratectomies and things like that, we often go for chloro. So I mentioned it's, it's not great for everything. Being broad spectrum, um, it works well. Um, the one thing it doesn't work well for will be your, your bacterial rods, um, specifically pseudomonas. Um, there are studies that look at the efficacy of various agents and, and chloro does come a bit short when it comes to to this sort of this sort of problem, so this is quite often when you'll, you'll get cases referred that just haven't quite been healing and they're, they're starting to go the wrong way. They often have a pseudomonas infection. They've been on the, the chloro for quite a while, so um, that's why it's always worth doing your, your bacteriology with these with these cases. Um, intraocular infections, um, so within the anterior chamber, um, as well as corneal abscesses that have reepithelialized, they're often not not the best um, to treat those. Um, just given that chloro has quite a poor um, penetration of the epithelium, so that's the, the main reason for that. Um, so the ugly part of it, I guess, some of the, uh, the, the side effects of, of chloro. Um, it's not as applicable with the, the topical formulations, however, it has been reported. Um, so you do definitely get it with your, your systemic administration, which has obviously been avoided in, in our patients for that reason. But bone marrow suppression is a big one. Um, I think it was a, a case a couple of weeks ago now with, um, I think, some six-day-old puppies who had an infection. And obviously, I had to avoid the chloro thinking how small that they were, um, just based on the fact that, you know, something like this could be an issue. So it's just worth, worth noting if you're ever considering that in a, a very small patient. Um, getting on to exocin. Um, so the bacteria have changed shape there. They've gone more a rod-sized rod, a rod -sized, uh, bacteria there. So... <laughs> um, it's a second generation fluoroquinolone. Um, it's a bactericidal um, medication. And it's also broad spectrum, but it does have more of a gram negative bias than, than chloro does. Um, and it's mostly available just in the drop formulation, as far as I'm aware. Um, it is good at dealing with those infected corneal ulcers that just aren't shifting with, with your chloro. And often we'll have a bacterial culture back, um, which will then tell us that we need to, to go about using this instead. Um, 
Pseudomonas is actually really susceptible to to ophiloxis in most of the time. So this is where it really comes into its own. So um, it's definitely worth worth using um, in that regard, as well as corneal abscessation. So it does have good penetration of, of the cornea, um, as well as into the anterior chamber. So I think if we have nice, nicely infected ulcers, potentially our melting ulcers, we'll often have them on both uh, chlora and exosin um, quite frequently. And that's just until we get any kind of bacteriology or cytology back. And then we sometimes shift from one to another. So if you're in doubt, I think these two will probably have you, have you covered. Um, I mentioned before, um, they are, have a bit of a gram-negative bias. So the counter to that is obviously some of their uh, gram-positive effect is not as good. So your staph infections, your streptococcal infections, particularly like strep canis, we've had a few come back that have actually been resistant to um, exosin, but actually sensitive to chloro. So it's just worth bearing in mind that it's, it's not a kind of silver bullet for every single infection, unfortunately. Um, some of the ugly parts of, 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 of um, exosin, unfortunately. So it is more epithelotoxic than, than chloramphenicol is. So, so we often don't jump to it as a, a routine first-line treatment for your, your, your normal kind of um, prophylactic antibiosis. So um, you will delay your ulcer healing a bit more than you would with something like chloro. So that is, it's worth noting. Um, it does have antiproliferative effects on your stromocratocytes, which also does delay, delay healing a bit. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, just to touch on isophel there, I think it definitely does have its place. I just wanted to make a note, obviously reading through the data sheet for it, um, it is only intended for a bacterial conjunctivitis. I think a lot of the time we think this is one of our licensed products, this is what we should be using first line for our ulcer treatments. And actually, if you go back and dig a bit deeper, it is just for the, the bacterial conjunctivitis rather. So I think although you'll be going off license with chloro anyway, theoretically you kind of would be doing the same with isophel if you're going to treat your ulcers. So it is worth going down the, the chloro route for your your corneal ulcers rather than the isophel straight up. Um, it does have a, a narrow spectrum of gram-positive activity. So I think initially when I started, I thought it had quite a broad spectrum, but obviously going through it and reading more, um, you, it, is, it is very much just to your, your staph and your, your strep within the conjunctival fornix that it acts well on. So it's very good. It's very good as a first line conjunctivitis treatment if you suspect infection. Um, antifungals, I'm going to go very briefly through this just because um, we see them so rarely in the UK, but it is worth, worth noting. The one drug that we use frequently for these, if we, if we ever see them, I think we've only seen three or four since, since I started, but um, voriconazole is a, is a good, a good all-round drug for these. Um, you get these through your human pharmacies. It's just a, an IV preparation that you get in a powder and you reconstitute that um, and you then apply it as a, as a drop. Um, so I think if you guys ever come across a fungal infection, feel free to give us a, give us a ring. We'll be happy to, to talk through how to go about doing that. Um, antivirals, so um, Vergan is a, a very nice gel that's, that's, that's really, I guess, become a bit of a game changer, to be honest here. I know a lot of the guys in the States didn't have this a while back when we had it over here in Europe and um, had a lot of questions about it. And it, it seems to be becoming more and more widespread, but um, it's a nice, effective drug. Um, we had a lecture of, um, from David Maggs, if anyone knows him. He's kind of uh, Mr. Herpes over in the States and um, kind of asked, how long do we give this treatment for? He's, he basically said to us, you know, they wait for their signs to resolve and they give it for about a week after. So that's kind of the the kind of ballpark that we use at the same time. I don't think there's a really a right or wrong answer as far as that goes. Um, all righty, moving swiftly on to the anti-inflammatories. Um, we look at the, the corticosteroids and the NSAIDs are the two main classes that we, that we use, kind of the same as in, as in systemic treatment. So from our side, I think the um, dexamethasone and your prednisolone will be your two main corticosteroids that we go for. Um, and then NSAIDs wise, we often use bromfenac, which is Yalox, or Acular, which is um, Keterolac. Um, your corticosteroids, they're cyclooxygenase and um, lipooxygenase inhibitors. Um, they do come in a variety of drops, ointments, and preservative-free options. So you do get little, um, little pipettes um, for certain cases. Um, so looking at maxidex and maxitrol, so if you've got, say, a, a post-operative um, bit of inflammation there, you've got immune-mediated keratitis, for instance, um, or you've got granulation tissue. I know a lot of, um, a lot of kind of SCEDs will have, um, will have a, a lot of inflammation, a lot of granulation tissue. If you think of those Frenchies, they get these raised pink masses afterwards. Um, maxidex, maxitrol often takes care of that. Um, so we also use it to reduce scar tissue. So a lot of, uh, a lot of pigments can, can benefit from this, um, and obviously neovascularization following healing. Um, unfortunately, with, um, as with everything, I guess there's always some, some cons. Um, the dexamethasone doesn't have very good corneal penetration. So 
Um, we'll often see cases come in with uveitis that have been started on maxidex or maxitrol because that's obviously the, the drug that's available in practice. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite have the same, the same effect as, as prednisolone acetate will have, which we'll discuss in a bit. It just doesn't quite get through the cornea as effectively. So um, for that reason, previous studies have shown that it has um, poor stabilization abilities of the blood aqueous barrier. They theorize that's probably because of its penetration. Um, so yeah, that's why it's not my, my main choice for uveitis cases. Um, moving on to, to Pred Forte, the little picture there's a little faker handpiece, um, just to show that we, we use this a lot after our intraocular surgeries. And for the exact opposite reasons of dexmethasone, it does penetrate the eye very well. So um, we use it for um, anterior uveitis cases as a first line and also our post-operative um, post surgeries. Um, it's, it obviously has a good stabilizing effect on the blood aqueous barrier there. So unfortunately, with everything, there's always going to be some, some cons. Um, with the formulation percentages, it doesn't make that much of a difference, but the one, the one side you could look at is potentially is a little bit weaker than your, your DEX is. Um, as a drug, that's the same as with systemic medications. Um, with the way they're formulated, it's not that much of a difference, but that's why I would go for, for your, your Maxidex, Maxitrol for more of your superficial, for your superficial problems. So going through the, the cons of corticosteroids, um, they definitely do weaken your, your corneal um, defenses. So that's pretty not news to anyone, but um, especially in cases like feline herpes virus, um, other bacterial conjunctivitis or, or keratitis cases, you will actually exacerbate or, or potentially cause those, those infections. Um, so it's just worth noting, you know, you're not going to want to start these without making sure that you don't have an infection underlying there. Um, melting ulcers are often um, exacerbated or, or even caused by, by this treatment too. So it's, it's definitely worth being careful in that regard. Um, a side effect of these, unfortunately, is lipidosis, pretty more correctly, a lipid keratopathy. So it does deposit lipid within the cornea over time. So um, you'll often pick these up when you've had patients on longer-term pred forte or, or maxidex maxitrol treatments. Um, there are studies that show it can actually increase IOP, or the intraocular pressure, in, in people um, and in cats. Um, and they have also shown it in, in primary open angle uh, glaucoma beagles. So just worth noting, if you suddenly have these weird pressure spikes in any of your patients, I mean, it's, it's possible that this could be, could be a cause. Um, then obviously you have your, your systemic effects. You've got your um, hypothalo, hypothalamo, um, pituitary, adrenal axis that can be affected. Um, going on to NSAIDs. Um, so the two main ones that we, we look at mostly and we dispense mostly are Yalox and Acula. Um, they're also COX inhibitors. Mechanisms of action and why we use them, they're very similar to the corticosteroids. They're often slightly less potent as anti-inflammatories. So um, We'll often use them as we're tapering anti-inflammatory treatments down. So we're getting patients off steroids. We get them onto the non-steroidals for our longer-term treatments. So um, if there's also patients such as diabetic dogs, for instance, we try to get them off the steroids as quick as we can. Your, your non-steroidals like Yalux are a good option to go for. Um, and if you do have a bit of mild inflammation or long-term therapy, so say you've got cataracts that are inoperable for whatever reason, we'll have them on Acula long-term. Um, <clears throat> they're not as good as targeting the... Um, immune-mediated diseases as the, the steroids are. So if you've got like a, a panis dog, for instance, or an immune-mediated keratitis case, your, your topical steroids are going to be better than your, your NSAIDs for that. Um, the same sort of um, side effects will be, will be applicable. So um, I think there's some studies from the late 90s that showed potential that, that they could take away some of the corneal pain. You often see, um, and a lot of ophthalmologists will also do this, to treat um, certain corneal ulcers with acula included. So I think that's where that, that sort of comes from, um, to take away the inflammatory component and the pain component to that. But we have to be a bit careful of, of all of this because it does definitely delay wound healing and, and it can cause the same issues that, that your steroids can. So um, I don't personally routinely use, use acula or yellox with, with the ulcers, but um, I know that definitely some ophthalmologists will. Um, and again, it's, it's got the ability to increase the IOP in both dogs and cats. Um, moving on to the antihypertensives. So these are kind of our, our anti-glaucoma drugs. Um, again, there's a load of them, a load of topicals, a load of, of systemic ones that you can use. We're just going to pick out the few that we use most, most commonly. Um, so we've got our um, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, or CAIs, which I'll call them just now. Um, and your main ones are brinzolamide and dorzolamide, and those can be combined with timolol. So um, you'll be familiar with like Trusopt, Cosopt, um, Azopt, and um, Azaga. Those are your, your four main ones that we'll see. Um, and then there's the prostaglandin analogs. So you've got latanoprost and you've got your, your travaprost, or your, your travatan as the two main ones that we'll, we'll be using. Um, so the main way that your CAIs function, um, <clears throat> I always go back to this tap analogy. People must be sick of this now, but um, you've either got you've got like a, a tap being your your ciliary body that's that's producing your 
the aqueous humor, and that's always on. You've then got kind of a bathtub, and that's your, your eye. Obviously, that's filling up with, with the aqueous humor the whole time. And then you've got your bath plug, which is your, your drainage angle. Um, so these function at the, the, the source or the tap. They're reducing aqueous humor production. So most of our cases, depending on how they are, if they're not presenting too badly initially, we'll start them on just the, the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, so like an azopt or a, a trusopt first. Um, and then as they're getting a bit worse, we normally move them up to, to like an azaga or a, a cosopt, so you're adding in your timolol with those. Um, <clears throat> frequency of treatment can go from, say, twice a day all the way up to about six, six times a day is your, your main. Um, we have to be careful when we're adding in the, the timolol um, that, you know, depending on the size of the patient, we are going to have some systemic absorption. I wouldn't be panicking if we're dealing with, say, a spaniel or a Labrador, for instance. I think that's going to be very minor, minor effects. But if you've got a, a two or three kg Yorkie, for instance, and you're putting, you know, timolol in six times a day, I would just keep, keep my, uh, bear in mind the, the cardiovascular effects of that. Um, and the metabolic acidosis is also a, a potential risk with your, your CAIs in particular. Um, looking at the prostaglandin analogs then, we, as I said before, we mainly use the tanoprost and travoprost. Um, they, are, they work by basically binding to the prostaglandin F or the FP receptors. Um, so they actually um, designed these in people to be specific to their receptors. Um, that's why um, I think we had a lot of, um, we would have a lot more success with the, the older generation of the prostaglandins, but unfortunately they came with a number of side effects, a lot of inflammation with, with those drugs. So they've tailored them to be less, I guess, side effect evoking in people, but unfortunately that means they're less, um, less effective in some of our patients, um, such as cats. And that's why I've got the, the question mark there. It's a bit hit and miss in cats because of the, the receptors, um, you know, not, not quite being as, um, as efficacious. Um, the main mechanism of action here is uveoscleral outflow. Um, so it's basically that, that drain that I spoke about before. If you have like a closed angle glaucoma, for instance, it's still going to be a secondary out, out, outflow for, for your aqueous humor. So um, as a, a kind of first line emergency treatment, these are the drugs that we go for first. So we've got a little pipette called monoprost. That's latanoprost that we use as a first line. Um, and once your glaucoma is getting a bit worse, um, we often go to these and add them in in combination with our coponic and hydro carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and artimolol. Um, again, you can start off quite, you know, infrequently, say twice a day, and you can go all the way up to around six times a day. Um, <clears throat> I think personally, when you're getting up to about that frequency, it's, you're probably losing the battle, unfortunately, but you can definitely titrate up. Um, so I guess, where is the lens? That's the, that's the big question with your um, latanoprost or travoprost. So um, it does induce quite profound meiosis. So what you don't want to do is have an anterior lens luxation and then give this, and you actually trap your, your lens in the anterior chamber if that's the cause of your glaucoma, because you're then going to have a, a marked spike, unfortunately, in, in your pressure. Um, just picturing what my face would be like if I ever did that by mistake, and that's, that's pretty much it. I'm good. One final thought was just on remand, because um, we see it so commonly. Um, it's a very, very good topical lubricant, um, and we see it used all the time. It's a great topical lubricant. Unfortunately, the, the name is very misleading, and it's not, in fact, a corneal repair gel on its own, unfortunately. So we, we have seen cases referred where um, the carers have been like, no, we've taken all the antibiotics, but we've put on the, the repair gel, so we're fine now. Um, and I think it's just worth noting that um, uh, the corneal repair gel, mafia is not going to come hunt me down, but it's, 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 it's not going to work on its own. But um, no, it definitely has its place. Um, for, for lubricating it, it is very, very good. Right, thanks everybody. My presentation is about SCADS. It will be slightly shorter, but also quite practical, so hopefully it will entertain you as well. Um, I decided to do a minimized presentation about SCADS, basically our approach and how we manage them, how we diagnose them, because otherwise we'll be talking ages about it and we have the rugby players, as you know. So. <laughs> First of all, what is a SCAD? It's an acronym for Spontaneous Corneal um, Epithelial Defect. Um, don't forget chronic. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, they are also known as non-healing ulcers and indolent ulcers. You might find them in some textbooks as boxer ulcers, even though we don't use that term anymore because we know that they can be found in any breed of dogs. There is a prevalence in boxers, also in Frenchies and in Corgis, but we know that they can present in any dog. Uh, the the uh, theoretical definition is chronic superficial ulcers that fail to resolve through normal wound healing processes, and we will see why they have been defined that way. Now, the diagnosis is per exclusion, which might be hard, but we are lucky because the lesion looks uh, quite pathognomonic. So, uh, we diagnose them in uh, middle-aged dogs or older 
with an average of eight, nine years. And uh, to diagnose a SCED, we have to make sure that the eye is not affected by any other condition that might uh, uh, delay wound healing. So we have to exclude corneal trauma. We have to exclude dry eye and uh, anything else like a dystichia or an ectopic cilium that might have caused the defect. Delayed wound healing, because we are talking about a SCED when uh, they failed to heal for at least a week, maybe two, on the medical treatment. They are usually painful, especially for the first uh, few days, uh, but the discomfort can be variable. And they have to be superficial corneal ulcer, which means there's no stromal involvement. Only the superficial stroma is visible. And uh, we'll see how we recognize that in just a moment. And they also present in various shapes and size. There has to be some underrunning of fluorescein. So after we apply the dye, we have to see a rim of underrunning of, uh, of um, colorant just under the edges around the ulcer. We will see an example in just a moment as well. So first of all, how do we know if an ulcer is superficial? It can be hard in some cases. This one is probably the least, ob least obvious that I will show you. And uh, yes, it is staining on the surface, but in the middle of the ulcer, we would see a defect and even the fluorescein is staining a little bit less. And this eye, just with the naked eye evaluation, probably has uh, some stromal involvement. It might as well be a melting ulcer, but it definitely, we won't treat it as a sked. This eye from the side, uh, it's the same. You just need your naked eye. We probably have a sked as well, because you can see the underrunning uh, uh, fluorescein, but we definitely have a dent, so we know if, that it's not superficial because the stroma is definitely involved. Another example of a stromal involvement, uh, we would call it a desmetosil probably, and uh, even without uh, fluorescein staining, uh, we can see a big dent uh, and the whole stroma is involved, so don't treat it as a sked. This might as well be a sked. We can see that the ulcer is very superficial. There is some loose epithelium on the edges, but most of all, with our naked eye, we can't see any, any dent, any crater at all. So, oh, the image is not showing. It's pretty nice. Uh, so in the image that you can't see for some reason, you would have seen a slit, sorry about that. Um, so w we know if that they're not super fit, they are superficial when they look like the pre picture we just seen. To, uh, if you're not sure, you can use either a direct ophthalmoscope, which is readily available in practice, or a slit lamp if you have one. They both have in common the option of using the slit function instead of the beam, and with that you can actually focus on the defect. The picture I was, I was going to show you has a slit that uh, focuses on the cornea, then on the stroma, and then on the cornea again. So you can actually reproduce that. The presentation is attached in the end, so you can actually download it and see all the images. The rim of epithelial around it, as I said, is quite pathognomonic. So to our, uh, in this picture, it's the same eye of an 11-year-old chihuahua, and uh, you will see two different outlines. So the outline uh, uh, marked in yellow is the apparent outline that we would see if we just stain it with fluorescein, and uh, the central area appears um, quite bright green, whereas the edges are more faint. That's because the epithelium is not attaching, but there is still space for the fluorescein to go under. So the actual outline of the ulcer might be just larger, just a bit larger as it is in this picture, or even much larger. Sometimes it expands for the, to the whole cornea. So always keep in mind that the actual uh, surrounding of the, of the sked can be a lot larger than what you see. Now, in this image from a histopathology uh, slide, we can see a cornea from um, a, a slice of cornea with all the uh, layers that we mentioned so far. So the poorly attached epithelium is there. He's trying to attach, but he just can't because um, on the surface of the stroma, we have a hyaline membrane. This membrane is the reason why SCADs fail to heal because they are completely acellular. So until we get rid of that membrane, which is technically not a membrane, but we just call it membrane or zone, until we get rid of that, it will just fail to heal. And underneath, you will see some stromal fibroplasia, which is just a consequence to the pathology. Now, the way we treat the mother valve, um, it's quite straightforward and practical. We do a mechanical debridement, and we place a contact lens. And both are pretty important parts of our SCED treatment. And yes, of course, we do some medical treatment, and we will go through that in the, just at the end of the presentation. Now, the mechanical debridement, has a, one great benefit. It can be performed on conscious or sedated patients. It doesn't have to be done under general anesthesia. Obviously, it can be if the patient is challenging or if for any other reason it's safer to do it that way. 
It is a procedure that we can repeat, but we would always leave a gap of one or two weeks between the different treatments. And uh, there are various methods. You might know about the grid keratotomy or the punctate, um, but we, uh, we'll, I was going to go through the two methods that we use, which are the cotton bud debridement with a cotton tip applicator or a diamond bar debridement. <coughs> now, the first one is the cotton bud debridement, which we sometimes call dry debridement, and uh, it has a success rate of about 50%, because even though it, do it is technically a debridement, it doesn't really get rid of the hyaline membrane, the hyaline zone. It just uh, addresses the epithelium. So it is something that we do in some cases combined with a diamond bird debridement just before we do the procedure, or sometimes we do this alone or as a secondary procedure based on the case. So um, we always judge it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we prepare the eye with uh, some diluted iodine. The concentration we use is 150, and uh, it's always good to apply some uh, proximetocaine or another topical anesthetic. And uh, in that picture, you can see the lidocaine fluorescein, which is quite handy sometimes. And uh, we use a cotton bud uh, that has to be sterile. It can be either a disposable sterile cotton bud, or you can use a microbiology swab if that's easier to obtain in practice. We, the aim of this debridement, as we said, is just to remove uh, the non-adherent epithelium around the edges of the sked. So we don't actually address the center of the defect, but just the edges around it. And we will see an example just shortly. We do a gentle debridement but it has been reported in literature that uh, the normal epithelium cannot be removed with a cotton bud. So as long as you can uh, remove the epithelium, it means that that needs to come out. The, uh, the cotton bud debridement is most effective when dry. That's why it's called a dry debridement, because we would use a dry tip, and then when it gets too moist, we have to replace it. So sometimes we use multiple applicators. At the end of the procedure, it's always good to apply some fluorescein that just helps you to determine whether there's any more epithelium that needs to be removed, and that could be a reason for treatment failure. So um, it comes quite handy. Now, the diamond bird debridement has a different goal. We do the same prep that we did before, so I'm not going to repeat it, but it's exactly the same. And we use an alga brush, which is a battery-powered machine with a, a sterilizable tip uh, with uh, a three millimeter medium great burr. So um, it's relatively cheap and it's uh, um, available in practice for about 10 years now. And um, we perform this debridement after we remove the epithelium to remove the superficial uh, hyaline zone. We will see an example now. The average time that we can spend on to an eye is about 60 seconds. Uh, there's been reports that say that if we spend less than 45 seconds onto an eye, we are unlikely to remove the whole uh, membrane, but obviously it depends on the, on the situation. Uh, two top tips for this procedure. Uh, the burr has to be sterile, um, otherwise obviously we are likely to create a super infection. And uh, we always have to stop if the stroma is visible. Um, so always keep checking, uh, get a slit lamp or an ophthalmoscope ready and uh, have, an eye, have a look if you can see a dent and always avoid it with the diamond burr because otherwise it can be quite dangerous. And uh, yeah, as I said, it reduces the superficial hyaline zone. And if we see a, another histo image that um, this is the same eye before and after diamond bird debridement, possibly after a few days, uh, to our left, we can see the dark blue uh, hyaline membrane and uh, stromal hypoplasia. And to our right, uh, the eye is actually much happier. The stromal, uh, the membrane is all gone and now the epithelium is ready to grow, grow in. Now, here is a practical example. The eye to our, is the same eye. On our left, the eye is being prepped and it's ready for the procedure. We see a lot of epithelium and uh, some underrunning on the ventral cornea. And the first part of the procedure, as we know, is to remove that excessive epithelium. And we do, we, we do it with a dry cotton bud debridement. And after that, it, the, it reveals a much larger size of the ulcer. We could potentially go on a little bit more until we, until we feel uh, that the diamond bar can be performed. Then we perform an adamant bird debridement. Sometimes we start from the center of the defect and we address the stroma directly. And at the end of the procedure, you might see that the whole eye might be uptaking fluorescein if the whole eye was affected. Don't worry, it's just uh, uh, it will be a good outcome anyway, actually even better uh, because the corneal epithelium can grow on top of it. Now, another, most impor another important part of the management of a SCED is the placement of a contact lens. And, uh, 
they have two main benefits. Uh, they, it's been reported, they have been reported to improve uh, corneal healing. So they do that because of um, mechanical protection. Uh, they avoid the uh, eyelids to, to rub onto the defect and they control uh, the turgestion, the turgestions. So they maintain the correct hydration of the cornea. They also improve a lot of um, the comfort from, from the patient because we know they are very sore the first, for the first few days. So it's always a, a kind thing to put a contact lens on. Um, when we uh, put a contact lens for very, various reasons, we might prefer drops to ointment. We, have a, we could have a higher risk of displacing the lens. And uh, the way we place a lens is uh, quite simple. They are disposable human contact lenses. I know that Heidi will go through that in a moment, so I will not talk about it too much. And uh, just an image of how they can present. So to our left, uh, the edges are not uh, cup-shaped. Uh, we want them to be as, if, uh, as they are on the right when, they, when the contact lens is ready to be applied onto the eye. And they can stay um, for an average of two weeks. Then we do some medical treatment. So it's quite practical. You'll find a lot on textbooks. What we do at the Ralph is we usually give chloramphenicol. As we know, it's a nice broad spectrum antibiotic. So we use it for prophylaxis. <laughs> then we would apply some uh, atropine, usually just one drop at the time of the, um, of the diamond bird debridement over of the procedure. And it improves comfort and it creates a bit of mediasis. And we normally give uh, meloxicum to our patients unless they uh, can't have it. So in that case, we will give another kind of painkiller like paracetamol. And we would um, place a buster collar uh, for, to prevent self-traumatism. What will we do after we've done all the above? We would recheck our patient in 10, 14 days. We wouldn't expect this cat to be completely healed after the treatment in, uh, within seven days. We usually give it a little bit more time. And uh, if they fail to heal, which is possible, we can repeat the debridement, uh, let's say two or three times. And with uh, 10, 14 days of distance, that would be a wise option. If it fails to heal uh, after two or three times, we can do a procedure which is a superficial keratectomy, which has a 95 plus success rate. It's nearly 100% in some books, whereas the diamond bird debridement has an 85% success rate. So it varies quite, it uh, increases quite a lot significantly, uh, but the downside of this procedure, it has to be done under general anesthesia. It is expensive, and sometimes it has to be a referral procedure if it's not available in practice. Thank you for your attention. You can download the presentation uh, by scanning the QR code to the left. Thank you. We're going to finish off with um, some, some tips from me. Um, I have to confess that when all the other um, teams that I've worked at have never kept to time. Um, and so I didn't think I'd have to do very much at the end. Um, <laughs> and I, <laughs> I've been caught out badly because they've all kept very to time. Guido's just shown me his, on his phone. It was 15 minutes. Um, so quite seriously, I'm going to do 10, 10 tips. And um, they're very random. Some of them um, will link in with some of the talks tonight, um, which is really nice, and some won't. So the first thing is the menace response. And again, I, I, the first three tips are actually about the basic eye examination. So um, this is the main um, test for vision. We're, we're pretty um, crude, the way we test vision in animals. Um, and I just wanted to point out a couple of things. So um, we have, most patients have two eyes um, and the visual fields overlap. So it's really important to cover the eye that you're not testing, okay? Um, and the other thing is to not create air currents um, when you're doing the menace response. So you can do it in lots of different ways. You can use your whole hand, you can use one finger. It's a quick threatening gesture, threatening meaning menace. But just try not to stimulate the um, sensation around the eye so that you get a false positive. So there's a video here, and I'll show it a couple of times, but this video is combined with a palpebral reflex. So the end point of a menace response is, is you're looking for a blink. If they've got facial nerve paralysis, they won't blink, and you'll get a false positive. Do you see what I mean? So we always just quickly test, tap median laterally to test the palpebral reflex and make sure they can blink. Okay, so the eye is nicely covered, and we're getting the attention. Now, why, why did we whistle then? Um, that's because 
um, animals get bored if you keep doing it. Um, your, your best assessment is seriously, the, do it properly like once, cover the eye. The first time you do it, you'll get the most reliable response. Um, cats especially are just like, yeah, we don't care. You know, when So you can get a lot of false negatives in cats and rabbits as prey species don't have a menace. The menace is a learned response. It involves the cortex and it's present from about three months. So when you do your puppy kitten, um, puppy and kitten checks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, so on, you know, they may not menace and that's not necessarily anything to be worried about. Um, Azura's done a, a great talk on um, dry eye and um, has made this a little bit redundant, but I just wanted to um, point out something about the Schirmer-Tier test. So Azura explains to us that the Schirmer, that the tear film has three parts and that the Schirmer-Tier test measures the aqueous part. Um, and it measures the two things. It measures the basal tear production that's going on all the time and it also measures the reflex tear production. Okay, so the reflex tear production means the paper strip has to contact the cornea. So where you place it is really important. So um, this is you need to place it in the middle to lateral third of the lower eyelid. If you place it more medially and it's just in contact with the third eyelid, you won't stimulate that reflex component of the of the test, and so you get might get a lower reading. Okay. Um, you all know to bend it over at the notch. Um, different ways of putting it in. Sometimes you feel really quite, you've achieved a lot that day when you've got it in a pug. So, um, you know, I'm a French bulldog, so I totally get that. We all get that. But just try and aim for sort of lateral. Um, and the other thing is whether you keep the eyelids open or closed. So until recently, most people thought it didn't matter. Um, there's been a study done recently that showed it was um, more less likely to fall out if you keep it closed, which I guess makes sense. Um, so we generally keep it closed. Um, the third tip on eye examination is fluorescein. Um, fluorescein solution is um, what we're testing here, not the fluorescein in a dry form. So basically, fluorescein has to be in a wet form when it's applied to the eye. Um, so there's, you can either get the fluorette strips um, or you can get the little pipettes of fluorescein solution. Um, but if you're using the strips, you must wet it with just about anything, to be honest, I'm sorry. Um, drop a saline, tap water, false tears, really doesn't matter, just something. Um, and then you touch the, can you see my pointer, sort of? You touch the strip, you lift the upper lid up and you touch the strip to the bulb conjunct cyber underneath the upper lid rather than the cornea, okay? Um, and then you um, allow it to blink to, to spread it around and then flush the excess out. Um, and you can get, why is it so important to flush it out? Because you can get false um, positives. So this, um, this also looks pretty superficial to me. You can see there's a lot of fluorescein in the eye, which is good. There's a lot of discharge going on as well, like mucus and hair and so on. Um, and the same eye flushed is that, so it's a dysmetaseal. So, you know, there you could think mm, some chloramphenicol might be okay. Um, there you might think mm, this is maybe needs a little bit more. So really important to flush it out. And the more you flush it, the more it spreads all over the whole face, the whole head, the client and so on. So you just get a little bit of a knack of having like a swab in the corner. I usually use probably two to three mils of, of saline. Um, if I do more and more, it just spreads it more and more. So I usually regret that. Um, Okay, cataracts and nuclear sclerosis. Nuclear sclerosis is the age-related condition in the lens um, that makes the lenses look hazy or cloudy from a distance. This is the same process that happens in people over 40, so you um, start to need reading glasses. Um, nuclear sclerosis is um, it's not a true opacity of the eye, of the lens. Um, so you can still see through to the back of the eye, um, the patient can still see, um, and that is in contrast to a cataract. A cataract is when the lens has gone truly opaque. You can't see in and they can't see out. And um, so this is a really great photo that uh, no, I did not take, but it's fantastic because it's a little old poodle. He's had drops in to make his pupils big and his left eye, so his left eye, has got a total cataract, no reflection at all need surgery, maybe. Um, the right eye has got nuclear sclerosis, okay? 
Um, so how do you pick up that reflection? You just need to pick up your ophthalmoscope, direct ophthalmoscope, set it on zero, and look at the eye, um, look at the sort of head from arm's length to pick up the reflection from the back of the eye. Like when you're driving at night and you see eye shine you know, from animals. That's, what we're, that's all we're doing. We're picking up retro illumination from the back of the eye. If you can see the back of the eye, it's not a cataract. And if you can't, um, it's a cataract, OK? Um, and this little cat has got um, very dilated pupils, no cataracts. And just explain about it a little bit more about the lens and so on, and, and why does the lens look hazy? The lens is like an onion, and it grows throughout life. Um, and layers of an onion are like added on the outside. There's finite space within the eye, so it can't just fill the whole eye. So as it in an older lens, like an older tree, the the central part of the onion or the lens gets compressed. That makes it hard, which is sclerotic, hence the name nuclear sclerosis. And that changes the way light is refracted in the eye, and it gives this hazy, opalescent appearance. So, so, some, um, so patients might come in, and the client might say, I think my dog's like cataracts, blah, blah, blah. And when you just do the, um, you know, the distant direct technique, and you can see the reflection, you can then say, actually, it's not cataracts, it's just nuclear sclerosis. And this appearance does change on the angle you look at the eye. So there's something called diffuse illumination and retroillumination. And all this is is how we catch the, the light. You know, So sometimes you look at it and it looks really hazy, and other times it looks, looks OK. Um, the next couple of slides about diabetic cataracts. So, um, diabetic cataracts in dogs are really, really common. The, the reason it's important to refer or helpful to refer them early is that we can then still see the retina in some cases. And that's great because then we can see has it got anything else going on like PRA um, that means it might mean it can't have surgery. The other kind of consequence of diabetic cataracts is lens induced uveitis. So all cataracts cause some degree of inflammation or uveitis to some extend but diabetic cataracts tend to form really quickly typically over like less than two weeks and they tend to get a lot more uveitis um, so if we see them early we could help kind of help you manage that you know how to what eye drops to use and so on so it's obviously diabetic cataract surgery is an elective procedure and it's expensive procedure um, and the patient needs to be safe for a GA they're going to have an elective GA for a couple of hours um, but they don't need to be perfectly stable. So um, I know how hard it is to get them stable. And so please don't feel that we are never going to criticize your diabetic management. You'll know way more about it than I do, that's for sure. Um, and so we're not critical of that. We just want them to be safe. So we want to make sure that the weight is roughly stable, they're eating well, um, they're not excessively PPD, definitely not ketotic, um, and no kind of GI signs. Um, cataracts go through stages of maturity like fruit getting ripe so we want to operate if it's like a banana when it's just getting yellow if you said if you spend three six months or longer like it can take to get them perfectly stable and that banana is like brown and mushy we may not be able to operate at all um, or we won't get such a good result and then the clients can get a little bit frustrated with that um, on all sides so this is quite an advanced immature cataract diabetic you can still see a little bit of glow from the back of the eye um, that's that's quite that's good good time to see it this is a little patient that I did a couple of weeks ago um, this these developed really quickly these are quite advanced um, but it's still fine they 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 were ripe as it were and we we were fine to do it um, but if in doubt, just refer them early. And I know it's a lot for the clients to take on board. You know, they've got a lot to, to deal with, but they will be upset if they, six months later, they could have had surgery and, you know, they haven't had the opportunity. What about um, if they don't want surgery for whatever reason, cost or whatever, um, what, what can you do to help? Um, so diabetic patients are really prone to dry eye, and it's not obvious dry eye like Azura was talking about. It's subtle. So you need to check the Schirmatier test, and it might be like 13, 14, and they're really predisposed to ulcers. Um, so check the Schirmatier test. Um, if it's borderline, start a lubricant. Um, and also consider starting treatment for this uveitis that I mentioned. So um, 
Acula, twice a day, both eyes ongoing is fine. Um, even if, you, if you're not sure if there's uveitis there or not, um, you know, it's, it's useful to start. So um, that will reduce the risks of a diabetic patient that's not going to have surgery, um, getting ulcers which get complicated, losing eyes from complications and so on. Um, the lubricants, um, so <clears throat> I just want to say a couple of things really about this. So um, when you go into hospital, you have a lot of risk factors for getting an ulcer. You're stressed, you're nervous, that's sympathetic release, dry eye. Um, you might be sedated, you might have a GA, all of those factors, ventilation, all of these factors really increase the risk of ulceration. So this is something that ideally we should all do in all patients. I'm not talking about eye patients. I'm talking about your patients that are coming in for like spay, castrate, whatever. Um, all cats, cats, are re cats never really blink, okay? The blink rate, I can't remember, Azura might know. One every five minutes. See, this is like <laughs> one every five minutes. This is somebody who's just done the exam, so they're totally on top of everything. Um, and they, they, they um, blink way less than dogs. So they're really high risk of ulcers. And um, again, I'm not, I've got a photo here of a little brachycephalic cat, but this is all cats. But brachycephalic breeds, dogs, of course, like complete disaster, everything's evaporating all the time. Um, patients on opioids, methadone, buprenorphine, really increases the risk of ulcers. So I think this, we could spend all night talking about lubricants. Um, I think um, Clinitas Soothe is like quite a good bet because you don't have to then dispense like a whole tube or bottle to the patient, especially if they're there for 24 hours or 12 hours. So the single-use pipettes. And what our nurses do as a kind of routine, our ward nurses, is they tie it in with the opioid. So if they're on methadone Q4, they'll have Clinitas Soothe Q4. Okay, so it's really helpful. And if they're under um, sedation or GA, um, they need something a lot thicker and gloopier than Clinitas Soothe. So the current trade name, and it keeps changing, but it's Hycosan Night. So this is the same as Lacrolube, and it was Hylonite, and it's now currently called Hycosan Night. Put in as a big gloopy amount to cover the um, whole cornea when you're sedating them, not just brachycephalics, any patient. What antibiotic should I choose for a corneal ulcer? Chloramphenicol, excellent. Um, so D is a bit of a ridiculous um, suggestion on my part, but um, the so topical treatment can delay healing. So sometimes people might think, oh, should we go um, oral on this? But not usually. So this, John has, has mentioned this. Let's just go through this. I don't really need to say anything here. Yeah. So um, be aware that I think chloramphenicol is a very kind antibiotic. It, 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 the epithelium is desperately trying to heal. There's these little tiny epithelial cells. They're trying to get across the eye and they keep blinking. You know, it's just like a, they're just really up against it. And, but the chloramphenicol is quite kind. It's non-epithelial toxic in comparison to the other ones. Okay, you've also already got the answer to this, but this wasn't quite so obvious probably. Um, this eye is painful because of a corneal ulcer, and what's the best option for analgesia? We've got meloxicam, paracetamol, acular, proximeticane. Analgesia at home, I should say. Yeah, excellent. Any advances on that? Paracetamol, maybe, somebody said? Mm -hmm. I think so. That's good. Great. Um, so we use these all the time. Um, paracetamol, we add in a lot. Um, and anesthetists do think that the combination of the two is superior just to um, meloxicam on its own. So we don't just use paracetamol if they can't have metacam. Um, and as John explained, um, you know, topical non-steroidals, um, they provide little of any analgesia and they actually delay healing and they can pre predispose to corneal melting. So we do not use something like Acular in a corneal ulcer. Um, proximate again is great for examination purposes, but if you keep putting it in repeatedly, um, you know, every hour, it only lasts about an hour, then it will delay healing. So um, the last thing was contact lenses. Um, so some of the older people in the room might remember that we all used to use the veterinary specific contact lenses. Um, and you had to have all this whole range in stock of different diameters, different curvatures. It was always a bit of a stress, like which one you put in, which dog. 
<laughs> well, um, the pure vision lenses is like a panacea to all this. Um, these are about, I think, nine pounds a lens or something. Set up an account with Bausch and Lom, or you could just go on Amazon and order them from Lens Store. Um, the bit that circles here is the diameter, they're all 14 millimeter diameters, and the curvature is 8.6, is that? I think I can hardly read it. Um, and we basically use this in a Yorkie or a Great Dane. And it's really, and they really, of course, they can fall out, but I think the retention time is better with these than with all the veterinary ones. Um, so we put proximetacaine in, we typically use some non toothed forceps, like Bennett's cilia forceps, place it in the eye, and we, we kind of try and forget about it being there. So we usually use eye drops. Um, and we can leave it in two to three weeks if it stays in that long, sometimes longer. Mm -hmm.